let's turn to John chapter 14, and uh, this is a familiar passage in the Word of God. Many could uh, quote it by heart, I am sure, but let's read uh, familiar verses from the Bible. Let's stand as we turn to John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 6. We know it, again, uh, many know it by heart, but uh, it's a great passage in the Bible. John, Gospel of John chapter 14 verses 1 through 6. Let's uh, read it together now, together. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, this morning, I want to just look at a, a simple gospel uh, truth and uh, the gospel as we find it uh, in uh, uh, the Word of God. Now, uh, Jesus Christ was the most radical, extreme, narrow-minded person that ever lived. Now, uh, and I think we can say that according to the Word of God, that Jesus Christ was the most radical, uh, the most extreme, uh, person, uh, narrow-minded person who ever lived. Now, when we study the Bible, uh, a lot of times we don't relate the Bible to our real lives, and we never really uh, get it in a practical way. Now, as we study about Jesus Christ in the Bible, now, uh, a lot of times we have a complete misconception uh, of Jesus Christ and what the Bible teaches about uh, the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. For instance, Jesus Christ was not a charming, people-pleasing person. Now, most people would write about Jesus Christ. They say, oh, he is very, very uh, charming, maybe like a lot of philosophers or outstanding uh, uh, teachers, or uh, he certainly was a people-pleasing person, that he went around and he pleased people, uh, always agreeing with people, a people-pleasing uh, person. Now, as we study the Word of God, we find that Jesus Christ, number one, was not charming, and number two, he was not a people-pleasing person. Now, as we study about and we're looking at Jesus Christ, and what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, not what people think or preach or say. But now, now, for instance, when Jesus preached his first sermon, now his first sermon was in the uh, synagogue in Nazareth. Now, that's the city where he was brought up in. And uh, so the Bible says there uh, in Luke chapter 4, that he preached there in the, uh, the synagogue. Now, and that's when he began his ministry. He opened the book of Isaiah. And in, uh, and in Luke chapter 4 and verse 29, it says uh, where he had been brought up. Now, this was his first sermon, not his second, third, fourth, fifth. His first sermon. And as a result of his first sermon... They wanted to murder him. Now, uh, I preached a lot of sermons, but I don't think uh, I've ever been murdered as a result of preaching the Word of God. Now, this is very, very instructive. See, when we read the gospel, see, a lot of times we read it, we don't associate what it's really saying. Now, see, what the Bible says very, very clearly is that they wanted to murder him. Now, it was only by divine intervention that he was not murdered at that time because obviously it was not in God's timing. Now, uh, have you ever known of anybody who preached a sermon and then after the sermon, people actually wanted literally, now not figuratively, literally wanted to murder him? And uh, I, don't, I don't know, that's uh, sort of unusual. 
And, uh, but you see, Jesus preached his first sermon. And after his first sermon, uh, they wanted to murder him. I think the only time I heard about something like that is that uh, down in, in the Southland, uh, a fellow was holding a revival meeting in the midst of a uh, community where they had all the bootleggers, you know, all the bootleggers down there. And uh, they said that um, if that evangelist preaches against alcohol, I'll go to the revival meeting and I'll shoot him and I'll kill him right there. Well, uh, the evangelist wasn't murdered, but he had quite a, a interesting time preaching there in that community. But now, after Jesus preached his first sermon, you see, they wanted to murder him. Now, I think that's very, very instructive at the beginning of his ministry, not in the middle, not at the uh, end. And then, of course, in the middle of his ministry, we read about it in John chapter 10, is where they want to pick up stones to murder him. See, and uh, that's a great uh, chapter on the good shepherd and so forth, but they actually picked up stones and they wanted to murder him right on the spot and kill him. Now, again, uh, only by divine intervention was he not uh, murdered at that time. And then at the last, uh, we might refer to it as the last miracle that Jesus performed was the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, the Bible says Lazarus was dead uh, for four uh, days. Everybody in the community knew that he was dead. It's not like he, his heart stopped beating for 10 seconds or 20 seconds. It uh, wasn't anything along that line at all. But uh, uh, now Lazarus is dead for four days. They already buried him. Uh, he's in uh, the tomb. And the Bible is very, very uh, clear that uh, this was the great miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, you might say, uh, many refer to it as his greatest miracle in raising this man from the dead who was dead for four days. And I'm sure many, most everybody knows about the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And that was a great miracle of God. But now, you see, as you read there in uh, John chapter 11 and verse 53, the Bible says, from that day forth, they took counsel to put him to death. See, they saw that miracle, the Pharisees. Uh, by the way, that's the religious leaders. Now, always remember the religious leaders are all messed up. See, religion doesn't save anybody, never will save anybody, never can save anybody. Uh, religion is illogical and it is inconsistent. Uh, you think of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, uh, the Bishop of uh, San Francisco uh, made a, 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 an edict against Nancy, Nancy Pelosi and said she could not take communion in the Roman Catholic Church there because of her promoting abortion. And by the way, she's one of the most uh, uh, influential people in the world on promoting abortion. So uh, he basically excommunicated her. Now, Nancy, this, I'm showing you how illogical religion is. If Jesus came back today, he'd be crucified just as soon, or if not sooner. So then Nancy Pelosi goes to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome that's overseen by uh, the Pope. And the Pope allows her to take communion. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, if you participate in an abortion or you're involved in abortion, according to Roman Catholic canon law, that is a mortal sin. So you're excommunicated from the church. Now, the only way you can be reinstated if you've had an abortion or involved in um, uh, uh, an abortion is that you have to go to the priest and confess to the priest that sin of uh, being involved in, uh, in abortion. Now, if you don't, then that is a mortal sin, according to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, she goes to Rome, and the Pope allows her to take communion, which means what? According to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this is Roman Catholic law. By the way, most Roman Catholics don't know what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. 
If they did, they wouldn't be in it. But anyway, uh, you see, according to Roman Catholic law and Roman Catholic doctrine, the Pope ought to be excommunicated from the church. That's the logical teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, there are a lot of conservative Roman Catholic uh, people that are appalled at the Pope and what he is doing. But the point I'll make, see how illogical religion is? See, according to their own teaching, now not my teaching or what we believe or uh, even whatever, but according to their teaching, see, you ought to be excommunicated. Now, so that means, according to their teaching, that the Pope, if they were consistent, should be uh, excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church, according to their teaching. Say, religion is inconsistent. Say, religion makes no sense whatsoever, and you'll never find salvation in religion. That's not where you will find your uh, uh, salvation. But now, you see, in John eleven fifty three, 53, from that day forth, they took counsel, see, to murder Jesus Christ. Now, what do you mean? He just, see, you study the Bible. See, he just um, miraculously uh, resurrected Lazarus from the dead. Now, see, the religious leaders of the day, see, the Pharisees and the other religious leaders of the day, they saw that and they said, now we must kill Jesus Christ. Because if we don't kill him, uh, more people are going to follow him. We don't want anybody to follow Jesus Christ, so let's crucify uh, him. And then in John chapter 12, verse 10, they also wanted to murder Lazarus. It's amazing what you learn when you study the Bible. See, now this was the greatest, the last, we might say whatever, miracle of Jesus Christ. And as a result of it, they want to murder Jesus Christ. See, and then they wanted to murder Lazarus, whom he raised from uh, uh, the dead. Now, the point we're making is that, see, nice, charming, people-pleasing people are not spit upon as Jesus Christ was. See, they're not whipped as Jesus Christ was literally uh, uh, whipped and beaten and actually nailed to a cross. In other words, say nice, charming people. You see, people pleasing people, they don't bang nails through his hand and feet and nail him to the cross. You see what we're getting at? See, Jesus Christ was not a charming, people pleasing uh, person because if he was, Again, they wouldn't have uh, taken that hammer and spikes and nails and nailed them uh, uh, to the cross. You see, now um, when we study the Word of God, we, we learn about the claims that Jesus Christ made and why they crucified uh, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, number one, in John chapter 5, and there's a great chapter on the claims that Jesus Christ made is James chap or excuse me John chapter 5 verses uh, 27 and 29 and in John 5 uh, 27 through 29 that great chapter on the claims of Jesus Christ see he claimed that in the future he would raise everybody from the dead now, that's quite a claim to make you see nobody else ever made that claim whether it's uh, Hindu, uh, Muslim, anybody. See, uh, but see, Jesus Christ made that claim. He said that in the future, he would raise every person from uh, uh, the dead. Now, that, that's quite a claim. And not only is it quite a claim, but as you study the Word of God, uh, you find that he never backed down from that claim. He never said, well, maybe I didn't know what I was talking about, or I want to uh, modify that some way. No, he never backed down from that claim. Now, in John chapter 5, and, uh, John chapter 5, verses 27 through 29, he claimed that he'd not only raise everybody from the dead, but that he would personally judge every individual. See, now that's a claim Jesus Christ made. 
he will judge every individual. He's going to raise everybody someday from the dead. See, all the, all the dead people. And then he said that he will uh, judge every person uh, individually. Now, you see, that means you. See, that means me. See, he will judge every person individually. He is a great judge at the great white throne judgment and the judge uh, of uh, the Bible. And then John, John chapter 5, verse 18, he claimed that um, he was the uh, uh, only person that would, can determine a person's destiny. And that he has the power and he has the uh, authority, uh, you see, to determine everybody's personal destiny. Now, that's quite a claim to make. That's not a charming, people-pleasing person claim. Say, that he will determine where you will spend eternity, where I will spend eternity. You see, and he will determine, you see, where we will spend eternal, um, uh, our eternal destiny. That, now, that will either be in heaven or in hell. Jesus was very clear on that. There are two destinies. Say heaven and hell. There's no in-between. There's no uh, purgatory type thing. Uh, there's heaven and there's hell. And Jesus Christ said that everybody is either headed for heaven or they're headed for hell. Now, um, again, that is quite a claim. Say that puts Jesus Christ in a special category. Who else can claim that? Who else uh, did claim that? That he himself, Jesus Christ, will determine every person's eternal destiny. Now, it's a Jesus Christ issue. Either go to heaven or hell according to your relationship to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, these are, are, are great claims that Jesus Christ made. Now, the interesting thing is that he never backed down on any of those claims. People tried to argue with him about different uh, things, but he never backed down on the claims that he made that he'd raise everybody from the dead, that he would judge every person someday, and that he alone would determine whether you go to hell or you go to heaven. See, and that's clearly taught in the Bible. Now, we read this morning his claim in John 14 and in verse 6, where he claimed that he personally was the only way to heaven. I am the way, not a way, not one of many ways, uh, not one of many ways of good religion. But, see, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by uh, me, that he alone, uh, you see, uh, will determine uh, who goes to heaven. That the Bible uh, teaches very uh, clearly that he said himself that he was the only way to heaven. That there was no other way to heaven except Jesus Christ. Now, always re keep in mind, there's not a Catholic way a Baptist way, a charismatic way. There's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. You see, and he made that claim. I am the way. But then he went on to say, I am the truth. Now, in other words, see, all spiritual truth is centered in Jesus Christ. Uh, that, that's where uh, all truth, all spiritual truth emanates from uh, the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. So, you see, these are claims that Jesus Christ made. I am the way. There's no other way except Jesus Christ. Now, now again, that's not the pastor's claim. That's not the claim of a church. That's the claim of Jesus Christ. And you can see why they uh, wanted to murder him. The beginning, the middle, and the end. And, of course, they did ultimately crucify uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in John chapter 14 in verse 27, 
Jesus said, My peace I give unto you. Say, Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. That's a great uh, uh, verse. Say, My peace uh, give I unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto uh, you. Now, now, he claimed there that he would give people my peace. Not the peace of a psychologist or a psychiatrist or positive thinking, but he would give my peace. That, uh, that if you come to know Jesus Christ and be a follower of Jesus Christ, he'll give you a peace that the world can never give you, that you can never find in the world. It's impossible to find that type of peace in the world. It's like uh, the uh, famous illustration that a, a preacher gave who was preaching uh, in London uh, years ago and, uh, uh, about the, uh, the clown. And the clown went, uh, somebody uh, said to the clown, uh, or the clown said, I have no peace, I want peace, I, I'm looking for peace. He was the most famous clown in the world at that time. And so he went to a psychiatrist, and he asked the psychiatrist, he said, I do not have peace. I want to have peace in my, uh, my life. And so the psychiatrist said to him, he said, well, the famous circus is in town, and the most famous clown in the world is in that circus. You go see that clown, he'll cheer you up. You'll be happy as a result of seeing that clown. And then he told the psychiatrist, he said, I am that clown. I am that clown. See, I get everybody else to laugh, but my heart is breaking within. I have no peace. Now, see, Jesus said, my peace. You see, give I unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. John 14, 27. Now, that's quite a claim to make. Now, look at our world today. Domestic violence at an all-time high. It's an uh, epidemic uh, in America. See, and what is that indicative of? There's not a lot of peace in our homes. See, uh, people don't have peace uh, in, the, in their homes. And uh, the drug deaths, over 100,000 people have died of drug overdose last year in America. And then the experts that study the experts say it's way, way above that. That's the record that we have that we know about. How about all those people we do not know about and were put on a death certificate, something else. But uh, so over 100,000 people last year have died as a result of uh, drug overdoses. And then alcoholism is at an all-time high. During the 4th of July weekend, there will be people that will be killed on the highways in America as a result of drinking and boozing it up and being drunk and driving on our highways. Not only that, but now it's, and I believe we could use the word, an epidemic out in the, with the boats and on the water. You got so many people that don't know anything about a boat and they buy a boat and they go out there and they booze it up and they're drunk. And every year, and I'm sure over the, over the 4th of July weekend, we're gonna hear about people uh, in the Jersey waters who uh, crashed a boat and died as a result of being drunk. And um, so, but it's, uh, that's our society. Now, now what, what's going on? See, people don't have peace. People are looking for it. Uh, they, they want it. And then depression, all kinds of depression. They tell us in New Jersey with the uh, mental health uh, people who oversee that in New Jersey, that uh, there's so many people coming uh, for depression that they, they can't keep up with it. Uh, it's uh, out of control in New Jersey, and I'm sure every other state in uh, the, United, uh, the United States. And then uh, how about suicide? Every corner, everybody. You see so many suicides now. And the alarming thing is that the experts tell us that suicide is taking place in the life of a lot of children. That breaks our hearts, amen? Children committing suicide? Teenagers committing suicide? Say, adults committing suicide. What's that tell us? 
people are looking for peace. And you can never find peace unless you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Then uh, um, we, we think of uh, people hooked on porn, uh, porn and the sexual uh, revolution in America today. You say, well, what's all of this indicative of? People do not have peace. People are searching for peace. Now, there are a lot of Christians that claim to be born again and saved, but they don't have peace. I don't believe they're saved. If you don't have peace, you're not saved. Why? Jesus Christ says, my peace give I unto you. Now, if you don't have it, you better check out your salvation because that's what he promised to give you when you come to him. We sang about it this morning in several of these songs. So if you notice in several of these songs we sang about this morning, it's talking about what? It's talking about having peace in the midst of a storm, having peace in the midst of a temptation, having peace in the midst of a, of a trial, see, and going through that type thing. But the bottom line is Jesus gives us peace. We have peace in our heart, you see, and that's a peace that he alone uh, gives. And then, and of course, in Matthew 26, 28, he made the claim that he was going to die on the cross, that he would be crucified. He made that claim way before he ever died, that he would be crucified. He would shed his blood and die for the sins of the world. That's quite a claim. That I am going to shed my blood, he said, for the remission of sins. I am going to die and take the judgment of God and I am going to take the punishment of God upon all the sin that the world has ever committed and I will die and take that punishment so that anybody who wants forgiveness can find forgiveness in my blood. That's quite a claim. That is the claim of all claims. And he made that claim in, uh, uh, for instance, in Matthew 26 and verse uh, 28. And then that Jesus Christ claimed that he was the only one who could forgive somebody of their sins. Now, that's quite a claim. That he not only died to forgive them of their sin on the cross of Calvary, but he made it very, very clear that uh, he alone had the power and the authority to forgive sin. Now, you see what we're getting at? See, Jesus was not a charming, people-pleasing person. Jesus didn't say all roads lead to heaven. Jesus didn't say, well, there's another way of salvation. Whatever you think, whatever you believe, whatever uh, you like, that's fine with you. No, he said he is the only way of forgiveness. He alone is the only one that can forgive us of our sins. There's nobody else can do it. See, no, no pastor, no priest, no rabbi, nobody else. But he said, I, and he claimed to have that authority to forgive sin when he was upon earth. That's why some people, uh, when he said that, they said, well, who is he? He actually claimed to have the power and the authority to forgive sin, see? And it shook up a lot of people, you see, when he made uh, uh, that claim. But then it's one thing to make the claims, but the wonderful thing about Jesus Christ is all of the claims that Jesus Christ made were verified by Jesus Christ. Now, it's one thing to say, you have power, uh, I have power to forgive sins, he's the only way to heaven. But you see, he verified all those claims by his resurrection from the dead. Now, he came back from the dead. Now, on several occasions before he died, See, he mentioned that he would die on the cross. And by the way, that was a great claim. Before he ever died on the cross, he said he'd be spit upon, he'd be beaten, he would be crucified. See, and he told that to his disciples 
before he was ever crucified. You see, and then, of course, he was crucified. But then before he was ever crucified, he told them that he would rise from the dead. And he told them the day that he would rise from the dead. He said, on the third day. Now, this is before he was ever crucified. On that third day, I will rise from the dead. Now, you see, his resurrection verified all of his claims. That's why we know his claims are true, because he verified those claims. How? By his resurrection from the dead. How do you know that he's going to judge you someday? He proved that claim by rising from the dead on the third day. And by the way, that is not only a message for Easter. As I mentioned many times, see, that's where the church is blinded. The only time they talk about the resurrection is Easter. No, Jesus talked about it before he was crucified, and the Bible is very, very clear. That's how he verified his claims. That's why you know he's true. That's why you know he's the only way of salvation is because he verified it by his resurrection. Now, uh, we like to look at just one claim of Jesus Christ. Now, there are many claims that he made, but one of the claims that he made was that he alone had the power to forgive uh, sin. He had the authority and the power to forgive sin. Now, that's a claim that Jesus Christ made, and he verified that claim in rising from the dead. See, his resurrection uh, uh, from the dead. Now, uh, we'd like to look just a minute at um, people who Jesus Christ cannot forgive. Now, uh, number one, see, Jesus Christ cannot forgive an evolutionist. Now, a lot of people believe in evolution. It's taught in all of our colleges and universities today. But why cannot Jesus Christ forgive an evolutionist? Because the evolutionist is saying that Jesus Christ is a liar. He was the creator. He uh, mentioned about creation in the beginning, Adam and Eve. Now, anybody who's an evolutionist is saying that Jesus Christ is a liar. He can't save a liar. You see, you call Jesus a liar, he can't save a liar. And then, of course, um, you see, he can't save a lot of good, nice, religious people. And the reason why he cannot save and could not, during his ministry, save a lot of what you might call nice, good, uh, religious uh, uh, people is because, see, most good, nice religious people say Jesus is a way of salvation. Now, that sounds nice. But nobody can ever be saved by saying he's a way of salvation, that there are different ways of salvation. See, Jesus can't save a person like that, no matter how good they are, no matter how religious uh, they are. Because see, what they are saying, when anybody says that Jesus Christ is a way of salvation, what they are saying is that Jesus Christ is a liar. He lied. You see, uh, because he said he was the only way of salvation. Now, somebody says, I'm a good, nice, religious peop uh, person, I'll go to heaven. Well, see, you're calling Jesus a liar. You don't get to heaven by calling Jesus Christ a, uh, a, a liar. And then he can never save any nice, good people. And the reason why Jesus Christ can never save a nice, good person, which most people believe that's the way of salvation, that go to the average church in America today, is because the Bible says there are no nice, good people. The Bible says there is none good. No, not one. Not even, the Bible says you can't find one good person in the sight of God. Now, in God's sight, uh, uh, in Romans 3, uh, uh, 3.12, there is none good, 
And then it goes on to say, no, not one. In God's sight, there's not one that's good. So no matter how good you are, you cannot go to heaven because God says there's none good. And he also says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, uh, and then Jesus Christ cannot save a good, nice, fundamental Baptist. No good, nice, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist can ever go to heaven. Now, keep in what I said, good, nice, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist cannot go to heaven according to to the Bible. No one like that will ever get to heaven. People maybe walk the aisle, they've been baptized, they've made some type of a profession of faith in Christ. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21. The Bible says that uh, they, many will say they have done many wonderful works in the name of Jesus Christ. That's Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Now they've done a lot of good works in my name. Do you think there are some good, nice, Bible-believing Baptists in that crowd that they said they have done many uh, wonderful works in his name, but Jesus said, I never knew you? Do you think there's some good, nice, um, Bible-believing Baptists in that sentence? I think there is. Amen? And he said they, he never knew them. You see... Um, and then, of course, Jesus Christ cannot save any good, nice, Pentecostal, or charismatic person. It's impossible for Jesus Christ to save a good, you see, uh, Pentecostal, charismatic person. It's impossible for him uh, to save them. You see, and there's a lot of people that think they're going to heaven because I'm a, a good person or I'm a Baptist person or I'm Pentecostal or uh, I'm charismatic. Again, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, Jesus said, Many will say unto me in that day, We have cast out devils in my name, in the name of Jesus Christ. How many people are in that category? And then in Matthew 7 and verse 20. Uh, 1 through 23, he said, many will say, we prophesied in thy name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, to all these people, Jesus said, I never knew you. Now, those who prophesied, and uh, the Bible says, cast out devils, did mighty works in his name. Don't you think some of them would be in the Baptist church? Charismatic church, Pentecostal church, of course they would. See, he cannot save a good Baptist, Pentecostal, charismatic uh, person. It's impossible. Jesus Christ cannot save them if they're good and they think they're good. See, th those people Jesus Christ cannot save. Just like I'm sure there are some here this morning and you think you're saved because you're good. And you're nice, and you're religious, and you come to the Garden State Baptist Church, but you're not saved. You've never been born again. You've never come to that point in your life where you really had a personal experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, the Lord Jesus Christ cannot save a good Roman Catholic. He cannot save a good Roman Catholic. Now, here's why. See, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that in order to be saved and go to heaven, you have to be baptized as a baby. Now, if you're not baptized as a baby in the Roman Catholic Church, you will not go to heaven. So, uh, anybody here who was not baptized as a baby in the Roman Catholic Church, according to Roman Catholic law, says you will go to hell. That's Roman Catholic teaching. Again, mo most Roman Catholics don't know what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Now, another thing they, they teach is that you must confess your sin to a priest in order to go to heaven. Now, in other words, as a Roman Catholic and as a good Roman Catholic, you must go to the confessional. You must confess your sin to that priest. 
If you do not, you will not be absolved and forgiven of your sin. Now, that's the irrevocable teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. That means it can never be uh, changed by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I'm not telling you what I think, uh, but what their church teaches according to their doctrine. You can go to Barnes & Noble and get a Roman Catholic catechism book, and it brings out their doctrine and what they believe and so forth. Now, uh, so, so if you're not baptized as a baby in a Roman Catholic church, and when you grow up, you don't confess your sins in a confessional to a Roman Catholic priest, you can never, ever be saved. You can never, ever go to heaven according to the Roman Catholics. Now, of course, as you read the Bible, that is heresy. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. The Bible does not teach that in order to go to heaven, you have to be sprinkled as a baby. And then, now this is Roman Catholic teaching, and uh, this is why, see, most Roman Catholics don't know what the Roman Catholic Church teaches because most Roman Catholics, according to their own church, are on their way to hell because you must go to the confessional to confess your sins to the priest. And if you don't do that, Say, you do go to hell. You see, and um, you must do that in order to have salvation in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, a lot of Roman Catholics never go to confession. I've, I've spoke to Roman Catholics like you have, and they say, well, uh, I don't believe in confessing my sins to a man, or I'm too embarrassed to do that, or whatever. Well, according to their church, you go to hell then. You must confess it, not to God, but you must confess it to the priest, and then he'll confess your sin to God, so you must be forgiven. That's heresy. See, no good Roman Catholic can be saved if they follow the teaching, obviously, of the Roman Catholic Church. And who then can be saved? You're saying, Pastor, it sounds like nobody can be saved. No, people can be saved according to the Bible. The Bible is very, very clear. But Jesus did say, in Matthew 13, uh, 7, 13 and 14, there's a broad way and a narrow way. And Jesus said, most people are on that broad road to destruction, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. But then he said, and he, he, this is the word he used, few there be, and then he used that word, findeth life. He said, few. Now, said many are on the wrong road, headed in the wrong direction. And that's exactly what's wrong with the world today. See, everybody's on that wrong road. They're going in the wrong way. The Bible uh, uh, teaches that. But few, Jesus, this is Jesus Christ. Few there be that find the way of life. Now, now who can Jesus Christ save? The only person that Jesus Christ can save is a repentant sinner. See, a sinner who realizes, I have sinned against God. I am a sinner in the sight of God, and Jesus Christ died for my sin. That's the only way uh, anybody can be saved. And the, the way of salvation is open to anyone who will realize they are a sinner, and the only way to be saved is through uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He cannot save any good person. He cannot save any Baptist person. He cannot save any Pentecostal, charismatic, Roman Catholic. He can only save sinners. So what he came into the world. The Bible says Christ Jesus came into the world. 1 Timothy 1.15 To save sinners. That's the only person that Jesus Christ can save is a sinner. And unless I realize I am a sinner and I need to be forgiven of my sin, I can never be saved. Jesus put it very clearly in Luke 5.32 and he, uh, of 5.23 Luke 5, 23. He said, I came not to call the righteous. You think you're all right? You have your religion? You're the religious leaders of your day? Uh, you, 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 you think you're fine? He said, I came not to call the righteous, 
But he said, I came to call sinners to repentance. See, the only person Jesus Christ can save is a sinner. Now, see, a lot of people brought up even a lot of good Bible-believing churches, but they've never gotten saved because they never realized they were a sinner in the sight of God. See, a sinner. Jesus Christ, he came to save, to call. That's the word he used there, is call. I came not to... Uh, call the righteous, but sinners to repent. And he's calling to you this morning. If you're not saved, he's calling. How does he call to you this morning? Through the preaching of the word of God. That's how he calls you. And he's calling. He's yelling. He's saying, come to me, be saved. I want you to be saved. You see, but there's only one type of person he can save. And that's someone who realizes that they are a sinner. That's why in Luke 24, 47, he said, and that repentance and remission, forgiveness of sins should be preached in my name amongst all nations. Now, what is his message to be preached to all nations? Repentance and forgiveness, remission of sins. See, that is the basic message of the Bible. Now, when you study the book of Acts and you find the sermons in the book of Acts by Peter and Paul, that was their basic message, that we are sinners, Jesus Christ died for our sin, and the only way we can be saved is through the Lord Jesus Christ. See, repentance and remission of sins. See, um, the thing that qualifies me to be forgiven in the sight of God is that I have to qualify. God only forgives qualified people, and the way you qualify is by being a sinner. That qualifies you for salvation. Somebody says, I want Jesus Christ. I accept him as my Savior. But have you qualified? Are you a sinner? Have you admitted your sin, that you are a sinner, that you need to be uh, forgiven? So he says, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name amongst all nations. That's the message of the Bible, that through Jesus Christ, sinners can be forgiven. Anybody can be forgiven who comes to him as a sinner. Now, in Luke chapter 7, we have one... Last uh, Sunday, and we were going to go into that this evening, uh, today, but we uh, sort of changed gears this morning. But uh, last Sunday morning, we dealt with the wonderful women of the Bible. If you don't have that CD, get that CD. See, the wonderful women, especially of the Gospels and in the New Testament. There's a lot of wonderful women that we read about that we neglect in the Bible. We saw that last week. Lord willing, we'll get into that more next Sunday morning if the Lord leads and uh, uh, directs. But in Luke chapter 7, we read there about another wonderful woman in the New Testament. And this woman, the Bible says, really loved Jesus Christ. She loved Jesus Christ. Now, that woman, according to the Pharisees, the priests, the pastors, the rabbis and, uh, of the day, they said that that woman was a great sinner. And they said, see, they had it all backwards, just like everybody today has everything backwards. See, and they said that Jesus Christ would have never had anything to do with that woman because they said, now these were religious leaders of the day, they said, because she is a great sinner. Now, she's a really bad person. Now, and they said if Jesus Christ was a prophet or a man of God, he would never have even spoken to that woman. And he did. And then Jesus himself said of that woman, he said, her sins which were many. Now, see, that's what he said about the woman. So the woman was a big sinner, obviously. 
because Jesus said, her sins, which were many. By the way, see, you don't get saved by saying, I stole a cookie from my grandmother's cookie jar. That's not repentance. You see, it's more than that. See, uh, Jesus said, her sins, which were many. You see, we need to realize we are sinners in the sight of God. We've not only made mistakes, we are sinners in the sight of God. But Jesus went on to that woman. Now, the Pharisee said she was a great sinner. Jesus even said her sins, which were many. But Jesus said in Luke 7, 47, you see, he said that her sins are forgiven. Literally, were forgiven. See, that woman was forgiven of her sin. Jesus said, now, now see, everybody, everybody knew she was a sinner. Everybody in the community knew she was a sinner. Now, you see, uh, so, and, and he even said her sins were many. But he said to that woman these words, thy sins are forgiven. He spoke four words to that woman. Thy sins are, see, your personal sins, all that garbage you were involved in is now forgiven. And then, of course, he said to her, I want you to go, your faith has saved you, and I want you to go and sin no more, obviously. But now, you see, that woman was saved. Now, and the Bible says she was saved. You see, and the Bible says she loved Jesus Christ because he forgave of her of her uh, sins. But you see, she got saved because she realized she was a sinner in need of salvation. Now, you say, Pastor, I'm good. Well, you can't be saved. You don't qualify for salvation. Uh, go to a church down the street, you'll qualify. They'll put you in the kingdom of God because you're a good person. But you can't get saved by being Good. Now, I'm talking about being saved. Now, uh, the Bible is very, very clear. I must realize I'm a sinner. The only person that Jesus Christ can save is a sinner. Now, every person here this morning is either forgiven of your sin or not forgiven of your sin. Everybody this morning. You're either forgiven of your sin or not forgiven of your sin. Now, if you are forgiven of your sin, that's because you have repented. You told God you were a sinner. You told God, I know I have sinned against God. And I believe that Jesus Christ shed his blood to forgive me of my sin. See, everyone is either forgiven or not forgiven. See, everybody here this morning is either on their way to heaven or on their way to hell. Now, you don't hear that on the college campus. You don't hear that in your neighborhood. You don't hear that on radio. You don't hear that on television. You don't hear that in the world. You don't hear that on the job. Everybody is on their way to heaven or to hell. That's what Jesus Christ taught very, very clearly. But the Bible says he came into the world. He died for our sins. And any sinner that comes to him and wants to be forgiven, he will forgive them. That is the basis of Bible salvation. See, all these great words about salvation, redemption, propitiation, reconciliation, all these great words about salvation in the Bible all go back to the fact that I am a sinner. I have sinned against God. And the only way to be reconciled to God is through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I trust that God will uh, uh, speak to our, our hearts. See, the choice is yours. Whether you are forgiven or not forgiven of your sins, the choice is yours. Whether you go to heaven or to hell, the choice is yours. You have to make that decision. That's a personal decision that we all have to make. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. And as our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed, I wonder this morning if you might say, yes, pastor, I want this amazing, wonderful forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers to me. 
Pastor, I want to make it real in my life today for the first time in my life. I want this forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers. Yes, I know I am a sinner. I have sinned against God. I know that. I believe Jesus died on the cross. And yes, Pastor, I want this forgiveness that he offers me. Maybe you're a father, and as a father, you know you have sinned. You're a mother, you know you have sinned. You're a teenager, you know you have sinned. You're a college student, you know you have sinned. And um, I know I'm a sinner, and I want Jesus Christ to come into my life, forgive me of my sins this morning. I want to make that decision. I haven't made it before, but I want to make it now, and I want to come to Christ and receive this amazing, wonderful forgiveness that he offers. I wonder how many would raise your hand. you say, Pastor, that's me. Say, uh, maybe for the first time in my life, I realize I am a sinner on my way to hell this morning, and I really believe Jesus Christ died to save me, and I want to be forgiven of my sin. I know I am a sinner, and I want that wonderful forgiveness that he offers. And you'd raise your hand. You'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Pray that I'll make it real in my life this morning. That I'll really come to grips with Jesus Christ and sin in my life and the forgiveness of sins. And Pastor, I want to do that. I'm not sure whether I've ever done it or not. But I want to get it settled this morning. You say, maybe I know I haven't. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. But I want to get it settled this morning. And you'd raise your hand. You'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Pray that I'll enter in to this great forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers. Pastor, pray for me. Now, you have the opportunity this morning to do that. See, the decision is yours. Nobody can make it for anybody else. Everybody here in 100 years from now will either be in heaven or in hell. Everybody here this morning is either forgiven or unforgiven. But Jesus wants to forgive you. And if you come as a repentant sinner, he'll forgive you of your sins. Our Father, we thank thee again for your blessings to us. Help us to lift up Jesus Christ. Help us to honor him. And Lord, above all, we pray for those this morning that are in the valley of decision. Lord, we pray they might make the right decision, and that is to come to Christ, to be cleansed and forgiven of their sin. And we pray in his name. Amen.